wanting to get out and the effects that's had on us personally, on our family, on our economy, and our country, and the world, all this sort of stuff. And uh, Lord, we are just so thankful. Uh, though it isn't the way it was and not the way that we, we want it to, to be long term, we are grateful that we are here and uh, look forward to the day that uh, this crisis is something we speak of in the past tense. Uh, and Lord, you, you, have, you have taught us a lot of lessons along the way, and, and I trust that the church of God is stronger uh, because you've led us through uh, this pandemic. Uh, Lord, I want to thank you for this church. They have, they have supported us. They have given faithfully, and they have done all they can to, to, to encourage the call, to pray for, and to be present when asked. And Lord, I want to thank you for them. What a blessing um, uh, we have here at East Frankfurt Baptist Church. All the churches I've been part of, uh, and I've been part of some, some wonderful congregations. Uh, this church is, is perhaps by far the, the greatest blessing in my life. And, and, and moments like this are a reminder of that. We're continuing to work. Let this not just be about survival, but revival. Would you be so kind as to help us in that regard? And Lord, we want to lift up to you a number of requests. Um, Carolyn and Bertha and Ken and Barbara and Levita and JW and the cyclone coming, the pandemic, uh, uh, Carlos, Mom. And uh, Lord, we ask that you, you would meet all of those needs. We walk through them and you know them better than, than we know them. And Lord, we ask that you would be so kind and show up in a great and mighty way. Um, may you bring healing where healing is needed, grace where grace is needed. Comfort where comfort is needed, and your presence is always needed. Would you be so kind as you bless them? Would you bless us as well? Lord, help us as we open up your word this evening, uh, that we would rightly understand it as we seek to rightly divide your word. In the name of your glorious Son, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, we want to uh, go over a few announcements. Um, a couple of things. One is... Um, just a reminder, because uh, we've had a lot of people ask about this. It took us a month to get it up there because we, we had some issues uh, with uh, um, getting things to work with the website. But we do do online giving, um, and if that is more convenient for you, uh, you can you can take take advantage of that. It's through LifeWay, so uh, if you've ever used LifeWay online in person, it's, it's the same people. So we thought LifeWay would be a trusted source. You know, there's other places out there, uh, but LifeWay is one that we... We, we, we knew well and wanted to use. Uh, on top of that, uh, if, you, if you haven't gotten a phone call from me today, if you haven't been online or checked your email or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, I don't do the ticky, ticky tack or the snappy chat, okay? Uh, but everything else, uh, we've posted our phase two reopening plan. And phase two, which this is kind of the, the launch of it, uh, so uh, Wednesday evening, moving forward, Lord willing, uh, we'll be gathering here, eventually get rid of the tape, stop having the prop open doors, wear a mat, all that sort of stuff. Those, those days hof hopefully will be start to be phased out eventually. Um, but Wednesday nights, we'll be right here, still do online, we'll do that until kingdom come, uh, but also be here in present. Um, next Wednesday, we'll be here. Our first Sunday uh, in worship uh, here at the church will be on the 31st of May, the last Sunday of this month. It's in two Sundays from now. Uh, at the 8.30 service. Um, and now, if uh, we'll, we'll judge things that those first two weeks or so, and, and if we need to, I had the 11 o'clock service, we will. But the thinking is, um, starting the 31st, there's three ways you can worship with us, in person, online, or in your car. Okay? And uh, we'll, we'll make whatever adjustments we need, but we want to uh, add as many opportunities people have to worship as, as we can. So the 31st, be the first Sunday that we will be here. Also that 31st, we, we hope to have a Sunday evening service as well. Uh, I was talking to Brody before, I think we're just going to do a, uh, a little concert thing. Uh, you all have seen enough of my face and heard enough of my voice over these last few months, and frankly, sometimes I just get tired of talking. <laughs> I am a guy, right? I don't like talking that much, okay? Um, so uh, my poor wife, like I come home and I don't, I don't want to say a word, all right? Um, so which she, at this point, she probably prefers it. Um, but uh, so that's the reopening plan. We are also starting to think about ministry in post-COVID-19 world. We don't have all the answers. I don't know anything about VBS. Pastors and I, we, we go back and forth. We all are asking the same questions. What are you doing about VBS? You know what the answer is for all of us? We have no idea. Some, some are more optimistic than others, right? Oh, next week we're going to start it. Well, no, you're not. But okay, you know, let's, let's, it, it's good to dream. There, uh, Peter Pan. But nevertheless, 
Um, so I don't know what VBS is going to look like. Um, I, I, I just don't know. Some of it may depend on what they do with school. You know, are they going to take fall semester back? If so, that may open up a door for us. What would it look like? What would the schedule be? I, I don't know. Uh, youth camp has been canceled uh, this year. Um, so children's camp, youth camp, all that stuff is, is no more. But we are looking at some other post-COVID-19 uh, ministries that we, we can partake in. We, we probably won't be able to get out the bouncy house and do all that stuff this year. But we do have a few ideas. I'm, I'm open to any other ideas you have. What does the post-COVID-19 world look like, and how can we meet real spiritual needs in that world? One thing that we're, we're wanting to do, it'll be kind of a fundraiser, um, but uh, also to, to meet a need. How many of you all have done a long, lot of spring clean in the summer? Or what, what, what time of year is it? I don't know. Yesterday was summer. Today was a sprinter. Yeah, <laughs> it's a sprinter. Yeah. Um, so we are wanting to do a big yard sale. I have members bring some stuff, and uh, we, this is something we were talking about with the uh, uh, stewardship committee before all this stuff happened to raise money for our debt. Um, and right now, that's the plan to where the money's going to go to. Um, but one of the things uh, we were talking with some people is poor Goodwill. When they open up, they did? Oh, my goodness. Y'all y'all were y'all are those people, aren't you? Oh, it, it, you know they're going to be overwhelmed over the next week, right? Yeah. Here's our entire storage bin, right? Yeah. The whole car. It's, it's, you know it's going to be awful. So, so we thought, why not uh, have some of our members, except for the Wittens, of course, uh, to bring uh, their stuff here and we'll, we'll sell it and uh, want to be a blessing to people. Uh, hopefully the goal isn't just to make a, a tons of money, but hopefully we'll be able to interact with people, uh, uh, benefit the church a little bit. Uh, but also provide some, some real needs to, to people. Um, I don't know. Uh, but that is coming up June 13th. I believe we ordered the sign today. We're going to put it out here. Um, so I believe I've looked at the uh, governor's calendar. Uh, I believe that will work on the 13th. But then again, he'll probably cancel yesterday's school or something. I don't know. Um, what's that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll be famous. You'll see my ugly mug again. So, look at there. Um, and Lane will be there watching, you know, WLKY. <laughs> That's my preacher behind bars. <laughs> Take that, Florida. Yeah. And, and I'll go to jail, and I'm not even a prosperity heretic. I mean, that's incredible. <laughs> so, anyways. All right, with that, let's, uh, let's look at Genesis. Okay? So, we have made it to Genesis 4. It has only taken us five full months to make it to the fourth chapter, but lo and behold, we are here. Hopefully you guys uh, were blessed last week by the worship team. I know I was, in that it, I took a Wednesday off. <laughs> I mean, that was kind of nice, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, they are just very, very gifted, so I'm thankful for them last week. But having gone through the first three chapters, that was a good time to take a brief break. So Genesis 4, my goal was for us to get through the entire Cain and Abel story it is likely we'll get through the first two verses. So, but in theory, we're going to move faster through Genesis now we're done the first three chapters. In actuality, that's probably a lie. So, um, Genesis 4, but this story is, is just so crucial for us to, to, to understand where the story is going. Um, and and, and we, we, we spent a lot of time looking at it uh, whenever we were in the first three chapters. So let's read the first few verses and, uh, or at least read the story of Cain and Abel, and we'll move on from there. Verse 1, Now Adam knew his wife, knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore a son, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, his face fell, and the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Okay? Uh, now we're not going to make it that far. We'll be lucky to make it into verse 5. That's as far as my notes go. Um, but um, I'm pretty confident we, we won't go, go that far. What do you think about where the story has gone uh, since the very beginning? Right? We've got creation, and the climax of creation was 
mankind itself, right? Genesis 1, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. So you have the creation of Adam and Eve is the climax of all of creation. And that leads to a reflection of, of, of creation itself. And so now we understand the Sabbath is the climax of creation, worshiping the creator who has given us this, this great creation. Chapter 2 goes over some of the details of day 6. We spent some time in that. And the climax of that story was the creation of Eve. Um, that, and, and then Moses gave us the theology of marriage. A man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. And they were naked and not ashamed. Right? That's the theology of marriage. And, and this is where the story has, has been leading us. So we have the first wedding in chapter 2. Um, and everything is, is going great. So we have marriage and its theology. Um, and, and out of this one flesh, when the two become one, it makes three, right? And out of that makes four and five and so on and so forth. And that's, that's God's plan. Well, we see in Genesis 3, we see the breakdown of that marriage. We see that now marriage has become broken. And, and it's become broken because sin has entered into uh, the marriage covenant. Before, there was no shame upon the husband and wife. But then once sin enters into the relationship, they, 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 they separate from one another, right? They, they, uh, uh, they don't want to be around each other. Uh, they blame each other. They try to cover up their own sin, right? And, and then they, they, they stand in judgment of God, right? There's, there's nothing good until the very end of Genesis 3. And now out of that comes God's redemption, right? And that's the pattern we're going to see. Remember, going all the way back to our first week together, that... The story of the Bible is how God brings order out of chaos. So he takes darkness and he brings light, right? He takes uh, the, the firmament and he separates it and he has order, right? He takes the land and, and he brings the land out of the water, right? And so on and so forth. So we have God entering a world of chaos and he's bringing order out of it. So Genesis 3, we see the chaos of creation seen mostly in the chaos of of the marriage. And what God does is Adam and Eve are separated. He brings them together in, yes, judgment and cursing, but he brings them together in grace. So we, we spent some time on this two weeks ago, so I don't want to belabor it. But you remember there is the uh, naming of Eve, right? Adam is naming her. That is a promise. You are the mother of all the living, but she hasn't had a child yet, right? That, that, is, that is a man living by faith and not by his sin. We also see God uh, removing the fig leaf of clothes and replacing it with uh, the atoning sacrifice of an animal, right? God is covering their sin for them, and he is taking the initiative for that. So we see the chaos that sin creates in the marriage, and then we see the grace uh, that, 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 that reconciles that, that couple, okay? Well, chapter 4, we, we could say... Um, um, First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Adam and Eve in a baby carriage, right? Not in a baby carriage, with the baby carriage. I, I know we live in confusing times. We're not that confused yet, right? Um, but now that liberals have the idea, we've got another victim group. Um, nevertheless, uh, back to the text. Um, so we've moved from marriage now to, to family. And, and, and what we find again is... What we have is the glory of God's gift, marriage and family, and what enters into the scenario, this narrative, is sin. Sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is to take you. It's the, it's, it's the language of an animal, right? We, we've talked about that. We'll look at it again, hopefully, next week. Um, when sin enters into the family, what happens is chaos. And what God does out of that chaos is he brings order. Now, you're not really going to see the order until you get into those genealogies, but we'll skip those because they're not really inspired by God, right? Now, we'll spend a whole week on those genealogies. That will be the week you can skip. <laughs> it's, it's, and if you do, I know why. I know why. But nevertheless, so with that, let's look at the first birth, and then if we can get to verse uh, 3 and 4, we'll look at the first sacrifices. So the first birth, here in verse 1 and 2, Now, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. So again, coming off the, the heel of the fall and expulsion from the garden, or they've gone east from the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve are fulfilling their covenantal relationship as a married couple by having children. The first two are named here. Now, there's more than two in the story. When we get to the question, where did Cain get his wife, uh, we'll, I don't know what we're going to do with that, but uh, you know, Google it, I guess. Um, but uh, 
Uh, we know that there's more than just Cain and Abel. Seth is named for us later, uh, right? Abel dies, Seth comes along after. But the first two are named here. They're the center of the story, of course. That language of Adam knew his wife. Now, this phrase you'll find throughout the Bible, um, and it speaks of, of marital intimacy, uh, but not just intimacy, but also intimacy that produces a child. So we see it here uh, in verse 1 of chapter 4. Later, it'll say Cain knew his wife. She conceived and born Enoch. That's not the same Enoch you're thinking of. This is evil Enoch. And then later we'll get good Enoch, right? And uh, they'll have a WWE fight or something. I don't know. Cage match. And then uh, Genesis 4.25, Adam knew his wife again. Gave birth to, to Seth. Uh, in 1 Samuel, it's the story of Hannah, right? Remember, Hannah, they struggle with infertility. Um, and what is it we read? They rose early in the morning worship for the Lord. Um, and Elka knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. That phrase. So it isn't just speaking of intimacy, but also intimacy that results in conception. Now, I mention that because I, I suspect we've, we've picked up on that in the Bible. But, but it, is, it is a reminder of a more biblical theology of what we believe about intimacy. So, so the idea of knowing someone um, is language that the Bible uses um, and is helpful in terms of our, our theology. Now, here's a question that, that uh, comes up. Maybe you've, you've wondered this question yourself. I'm going to do the best I can not to answer the question. And that is, was Cain conceived prior to or after the fall? So I'm going to use my cemetery um, from that liberal uh, seminary, my degree from that liberal seminary, um, and uh, I'm going to give you an answer to it. I have no earthly idea. Uh, but I do think the question, and the reason we ask the question at times, can inform bad theology. Uh, what, what some may argue is, not the, uh, not the answer to the question, but why we would ask it. If you believe that uh, mar marital unity is a necessary evil, just something that the world needs because because this is this, this is you know we, we need we need future generations to come. Well, if that is your theology of, of of unity, then then you're going to insist insist this took place after the fall, right? And so what you have is the fall, and out of that comes uncontrolled desires, and God says, "Well, now what am I going to do?" Okay, if it's just between husband and wife, then then you know that's fine, right? That sounds a lot like what the Catholic Church has done. Right? What the Catholic Church has done is it says that if you're a priest, a monk, a nun, or some other category they've made up that I'm unaware of, then, then you have to be pure your, your whole life, right? And in so doing, you've become holier than, than happily married couples who have a healthy life, right? Because, because you've, you've, you've kept yourself from that. Well, that creates a, a dichotomy that isn't found in the Bible. Uh, the Bible says this is a gift which prior to the fall is given. That's my concern with this, this question. Is, is, is the conception a, a matter of, of a necessary evil? So regardless of when Cain was conceived, it's, it's important for us to see the blessing uh, between Adam and Eve here. It is a blessing for their marriage. It is a blessing for their family that actually produces family. But notice the language. Not only did Adam know his wife... But she conceived and bore Cain. Now, Cain is the one we're introduced first. He's the oldest, of course. But the language that we find uh, in the narrative and also in Eve's language is significant. So not only do we see the covenant of marriage by means of the one flesh relationship, but we witness the blessing of that relationship, and that is family. Notice, you cannot separate in the Bible marriage from family. What we've done in our society is, is we, 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 we've done that. We've separated marriage from intimacy, right? Those are two different ideas now. We've separated family from marriage, right? You, you don't have to have one or the other. We've separated intimacy from, from family, right? Um, and so the big issue right now is surrogacy. I don't know if you all have seen this. Um, I believe it was CNN. One of their hosts, um, I don't want to do the bashing of the mainstream media. We'll, we'll do that next week, I'm sure. But um, one of their hosts has recently... Um, through surrogacy, because of his preferred inclinations, can't have a child. So they had a child through surrogacy. Um, and then later CNN does the story that there is a surrogacy 
orphanage? I don't know what term be used, where children are waiting for the parents to pick them up. The child, the children have been born, but because of COVID-19, parents can't come and get the kids. So what you have is a farming of children. And you want to know who gets targeted to be the surrogate mothers? Poor minority women. It's striking that our, our, our uh, secular society um, targets and victimize people who, who are sad that they're being victimized. Um, but what you have is a separation of marriage, intimacy, family, and all that sort of stuff. But you're not going to get that in the Bible. Um, remember, they were commissioned to be fruitful and multiply. And in chapters 4 and 5, we meet the children, the grandchildren, all that of Cain, Abel, Seth, and others. But here, Eve names Cain, uh, which is significant. It is Eve naming Cain, not Adam naming Cain. So far in the Bible, Adam has named everything. Right? Um, he named the animals at the end of Genesis 3, which I argued was, was not only an act of faith, but in the narrative was, was to remind us that God hasn't given up on man. Uh, uh, Eve is named, right? And Eve means life. The Greek is zoe, where we get zoe, uh, where we get in Greek the word zoo, zoology, you know, study of life. Um, so, so Eve is named. Well, uh, her, she is named here again. I think it's the last time she's named in the Old Testament. I could be wrong on that. Adam knew his wife. She conceived a son and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, here's the beginning of the naming tradition in the Bible. Chances are you were named by your parents for one of two reasons, maybe a little bit of both. Family connection. My middle name is Edward. My grandfather was an Edward. His, his middle name was Bowen. Everyone called him Bowen. My uncle's name is Bowen. Everyone called him Bo. Mom did not want any of their child children named Bowen. Okay, I've never met anyone else named Bowen, but so I got an uncle Bo. Right. Um, so his first name was Edward. So my middle name is Edward. Uh, my son is named Edward. His middle name is Edward. So he's not named after me. He's named after my maternal grandfather, which I haven't shared his name. That was important to me because my, my brother's first name is William. My father's first name is William. My grandfather's middle name is William. Yeah. His father's first name is William. His father, and on and on and on and on it goes. There's William McDaniels as, as, as far back as I've been able to find. So I told my brother, who's single and wants to stay that way, um, uh, and, and it's like, it is your job to continue the name of William. I'm not a William. I ain't continuing it. I'm going to continue the Edward name. So now we've had three generations of Edwards, and maybe one of these days my son will have a son and name him William, or Edward, rather, right? I, I, see, now I'm all, all confused. I'm so excited about having someone to talk to. It's just... It's, 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 uh, put the Bible down. You don't need it. I went to Southern Seminary where the liberals hang out. If you don't get the liberal jokes, Google it, You'll or hang out on Facebook. Um, so uh, the other reason you, you, you have the name you have is because your mother liked the sound of that name, right? Um, if I was going to be a girl, I think my mom says I'm going to be Sarah Paige. My middle name is going to be Paige. I don't know. I don't care because I'm not female, and I don't identify that way, right? Um, right? <laughs> right. My brother was supposed to be William Patrick. I asked my mother why she chose Craig instead of Patrick. She, but, but all these, you just love the sound of it. When, when, when a mother is pregnant, and everyone's like, what are you going to name the baby? And, and they'll give you like three names, and they'll say, I love the sound of that one, right? And we may say, well, you know, this name means X, Y, or Z. Oh, that's sweet. I really like the way it sounds, right? That's as far as we go with it, right? It's a family connection. Or I got a crush on this celebrity and wanted to name my child out of it, which is creepy. But so you name your child Apple. <laughs> we pray for your child. But 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 you know. Uh, but in ancient Near Eastern culture, to name a child was either a prophetic work, right? So you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's prophecy. Or it will describe the the context by which they were conceived or born. So, Jabez, for all those who, who believe in a soft prosperity gospel, even though you won't admit it, Jabez, the book of Jabez, right? But Jabez, the name means pain. That tells us something about the labor process, don't it? Can you imagine growing up? <laughs> this guy's literally a pain. <laughs> Just ask his mother, right? Um, right? So, so, we have that tradition starting here in the naming of Cain. 
In Genesis, this takes even a, a, a bigger uh, part of the story. For example, in Genesis 29, remember, Jacob's got two wives. Don't recommend it, uh, but uh, he's got two wives. And uh, you remember that Jacob loved one, and she was largely infertile. He didn't love the other one. She had a lot of kids. And when we get there, we'll really explore the story because I think it's fascinating about idolatry, jealousy. There's some connection with Cain and Abel here. Because what we find with Rachel and Leah is the thing they have, their sister wants the most, because their sister doesn't have it. The, the thing they don't have, their sister has, and they desire it more than anything. It's a very Cain and Abel sort of story. So Leah has a child. She names the first child Reuben. And the text says, Leah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Reuben. Notice the similarity of Genesis, er, yeah, Genesis 41. She said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. That is a dangerous path. We call that idolatry, right? And that you do this in order to receive this. That is, sacrifice as an act of worship for the benefit of blessing from your God. If Jacob is her God, then giving him a son, she believes, is what is needed in order to get what she desires most from her God, and that is love. It's, it's really dangerous. Reuben's name is, we have a play on words here. Reuben means, behold a son, right? It's, it's what's that monkey from, from Lion King? You know, <laughs> you know Reuben, <laughs> behold your son. Um, you can translate it also, see a son. Look, a son. And notice what she said there. Because the Lord has looked upon me, I'll name him, look, a son. Hagar does the same thing in Genesis 16, 11. The angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant, shall bear a son. You shall call his name Yishmael. Yishmael. Because the Lord has listened to your affliction. It's another play on words. Ishmael means God shamas. God hears. And so he's named that because the Lord has heard. It's a play on words. We get the same thing with Cain here. Now, his name is an interesting one, particularly for the first child born in the history of humanity, and it is somewhat difficult to, to translate. Uh, in the Bible, this, this specific word is almost exclusively tied to this individual. There's no one else really named Cain like this. There, there, is, there are others. We spell it K-A-I-N. I don't know why. Uh, I don't even think you can blame the King James people on this one. He probably blamed Wycliffe. I don't know. Um, so, so, uh, but it's a place name, Cain. It's also an oriental tribe, the, 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 the Canaanites, or the Kenites. Uh, but his name means possession. You could translate it in some context when it's used as an adjective elsewhere. You can translate it as created or created one. Now, that's important because notice the play on words here. What is that Eve? Remember, Eve is the one naming Cain. Not Adam. Notice what it says there. She conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten. Does anyone else have a different translation than gotten there in verse 1? You got gotten? Acquired? That's a good one. You got acquired? There you go, baby girl. Don, what's the message guy? Curious how they're going to fix our English translation, what Eugene Peterson is up to. Um, you want to have possessed? Because she had, uh, I've gotten a man. Oh, so you use gotten too. I've gotten, gotten a man. Okay, so gotten is, is probably the most English word that, that you can really use. Acquired is, is a richer word. That's that just mm, better than gotten. Gotten is like what you would read in Owen County. <laughs> Acquired is like. Not quite Thomas Jefferson, but we're getting there. You know, like, like, like a Calvin Coolidge. There we go. How about that for a reference? Calvin Coolidge. Now we're talking. Brought forth. Brought forth? I like that. Uh, I don't want to say that often about the NIV. But <laughs> NIV is the preferred translation of Southern Seminary, Keith. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, it's, it's not. It's not at all. Um, uh, I like the NIV. I'm picking all the not inspired versions. Um, but you notice she says, I have gotten... And the word sounds a lot like the word Cain. It's not the same word, 
It's a word that purposefully sounds like it. Right? This is poetry. So it's called, well, I'm not going to tell you what it's called. I'm afraid I'm going to uh, mispronounce it and it sounds like a dirty word and then, then I'll never. First week back and the preacher just. Um, but the word means, I'll text it to you if you want to know what it is that bad. Uh, but the word means, you know, bro, he's just, he's denying what it is. It's not, I just, from the country, you just don't want to risk it. Um, but the word means that when, when words, two words sound similar, and you use them in order to, to emphasize those. And so she, notice that she's claiming to possess the son, to, 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 to have gotten the son, something she has achieved. But notice she doesn't say, I've gotten a son, I've gotten a baby, I've gotten a child. What has she gotten, possessed? What has she acquired? A man. Now, ladies, gave birth to that firstborn boy, right? And everyone comes to see that baby. And you can say, look at my man. Ain't he cute? Cheeks just like his father, bless his heart. Is are you going to talk like that? No, <laughs> he ain't. <laughs> because in my experience with my beautiful bride is the idea of referring to your son, no matter how old they are, you're never referring to them as a man because that reminds you it is their job to grow up, right? You want them to stay just right there, cuddle right there in that hospital, the right man gave birth. That's the moment, right? You've, you've dreamed for all your life, right? You get married in order for that moment. You couldn't care less about the husband after that, right? You know, right? You would never say, behold, mother, I've begotten a man, your grandson. You wouldn't say that. But Eve does. Why? Why would she say that? And, and the reason, I think, is because she, well, back up for that. We need to remember the context of this. Remember when God cursed everyone? He, he cursed the ground, the relationship, all that sort of stuff. But in the midst of that, there is the, the promise of a seed, right? It's the battle of the seed. We've spent a lot of time on this. I think it is the motif of the Bible, right? And, and it is the battle of the two seeds. You have the seed of the woman, who will eventually crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Now, we know that is not physical language because the serpent doesn't have kids in the story. Nor, remember, does the woman, which I think is a veiled reference to virgin birth. So what we're looking for in the story of Genesis is good guy versus bad guy. Someone's got to be Thanos. Someone's got to be uh, the Green Arrow, okay? I know I'm mixed, Marvel and DC, but Green Arrow's better than everyone else, so just get over it. If it's my story, I'm sticking to it, right? So, so we're looking for the good guy who's going to crush the bad guy. And what is the good guy going to do? He's going to get us back to Eden. The goal is to get back to Eden, where man and God walked together, and there was peace, and there was no shame, there was no guilt, no regret, no fear, none of that. We're trying to get back there, and it's going to come by means of Messiah, born of a woman. And what's the first thing we see here in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1? Eve conceived a son, and you merely think this is it. It didn't say the serpent conceived of the son, but the woman conceived of the son. And so what is it that she says? She holds up and she says, See, I've possessed, I've gotten for God, a man. And, and again, go back to what the story of creation is. In Genesis chapter 2, it says, uh, Then the man said, This at last, right when, when Eve is created, This at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man. And what she's saying here, I was taken out of man, but I have created for us a man. I came out of man, but from me comes a man who will be our Savior, who will fulfill this promise. You see, that word gotten, I have gotten a man, it does mean acquire. It means to possess. It means to, to get. But often it describes God's creative activity. Let me give you a few examples. Genesis 14, 19. Uh, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor, creator of heaven and earth. Deuteronomy 32, 6. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? That word created is the word God. 
Psalm 139, 13, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I believe that word knitted is the word used here. Proverbs 8, 22, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of oath. Notice that that is tied to creation. And what is this she says here? Almost, she almost says, I've created a man. I think she's at best, we can see this as an act of pride. And remember that it's wordplay. The word gotten is similar to the word man. And so she's saying Cain is evidence of my work. This is pride at best. Thus, what she is proclaiming for mankind is salvation, her salvation. Now, if you go back and read the curse of Genesis 3, what, what was the issue there? The issue there would be pain and childbirth. And we talked about it's more than just physical pain, uh, right? And, and what is she she's saying? That through suffering, through my affliction, came my salvation. By the way, that is still a major issue for a lot of people today, isn't it? That we find salvation in relationships, in families, or anything like that. Now I will be happy because I have a child. Now I will be happy because I have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Now I will be happy because all that I've ever wanted has happened. She is guilty of this right from the beginning. We see this. And so Cain, she believes, as a fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, is she created him. Thus, as creator, she becomes redeemer. After all, didn't Adam just say, you are Eve, you are the mother of all living? Well, that's Cain, right? <laughs> Could barely make it out of verse, verse 1. Then we get the birth of Abel. Uh, and again, she bore his brother Abel. Now let's pause there. Isn't that a boring sentence? Right? There's nothing more to add there, really, is there? In verse 1, you, you get this. All right? they, they knew each other. She conceived, bore a son. He gets a cool name with a cool meaning because he's Savior. Right? Oh, don't forget Abel. Right? You know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be back in uh, 1 Samuel 16, Sunday morning, Lord willing. And uh, you, you know, uh, Samuel says, all right, here's, here's Shammah, right? He's, he's the guy. No, nope. all right, here's, here's, here's Abinadab. Cool name, by the way, for a good one for, for a guinea pig. Uh, no, no, it's not him. You got any more boys? I forgot about the, the little guy, right? He's, he, he's out with the sheep, right? That's what's happening here almost, isn't it, right? It's, it's very different. And I think purposefully so. The word able uh, does mean something you can do. Uh, but in the Hebrew, it just it, it means breath. And, and, and because of that, it, it, it means more than breath. It means that. But, but it means more than that. Because the Bible uses it to describe vapor. Uh, to, to describe um, something fleeting or even vanity. Let me give you an example of this. Breath of breath, said the preacher. Breath of breath. All is breath. <laughs> I'm just trying to be literal because, you know, I'm conservative from that liberal school. Right? It's, it's the word able there in Ecclesiastes. It's, it's, it's not the name version, but it, it's, it's from, from the same, same root. Now, the word breath, right, we understand that life is like a vapor. It's like a breath. You see it on a cold uh, afternoon or cold morning in Kentucky, and it's gone in an instant. Right? It's, it, it's gone. So that word becomes used to mean vapor or vanity. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. Ecclesiastes 1.14, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. Behold, all is breath. All is vaporous. All is vanity. Right? It's madness. A chasing after the wind. Um, now, the reason I think Abel is named this, I think there's two reasons why he's given this name. Remember, names aren't just because she liked the way it rolled off her tongue. She's telling us something about what she thinks about Abel. First of all, it's because I, I do think it's foreshadowing here. Remember, the, the biblical writers are good storytellers. Cain gets a mighty name of, of really Savior, right? That, that's a cool name to have. <laughs> Tough to live up to, but hey, you know, um, what ifs? Um, he gets the name short-lived. <laughs> and guess what happens in the story? His life is cut short. So I do think there's some foreshadowing here. I find fascinating. But I do think there's another reason here, and that is it demonstrates his position in the family. So if you've ever studied the Kennedys, you, you get this story, right? 
when um, who was the oldest son that died? Uh, Joseph. Joseph. I had Patrick in my head. That's a middle name of one of them, I think. But yeah, Joseph Kennedy, right? So you remember Dad Kennedy put put all of his eggs in, in one basket. It's going to be Joseph. What happened to Joseph? He died a hero. Well, this has devastated the family. Well, guess what? Guess what? Old Joe had to do. Well. Now it's the next in line. So now it's got to be John Kennedy. So John Kennedy's always living up to, to the old man Joe. Right? And then John Kennedy died. He was another able. And then he becomes RFK. Right? He dies. And Ted's like, I'll run. Yeah, I'm not going to finish the primary. Right? You know, I kind of enjoy this living thing. You know? So, um, well, somehow I think similar has happened here. The hope is that Cain will be the savior. But then there's an able, too. After all, able is often used to describe the idea that. Uh, in the Old Testament, that idols are of little substance. And so it would be described as, as breath or vaporous. And if you want to see an example of this, Jeremiah 8, 19 is, is a good example. I will take time to read it. Um, and also notice that, that again, that, that it's showing Abel's position in the family. The text doesn't describe his conception of birth the way it did Cain. Cain got a, a great introduction, and Abel just, you know, he, he's a background character. Um, Cain is the result of Adam knowing his wife. Abel was just born. Cain is given the hopes of salvation. Abel is just breath. Uh, he takes up a lot of hot air in the living room, I guess. Um, and remember that in Genesis, there is the motif of sibling rivalry. This is the first. And, and then you get Ham, Sham, and Japheth. And then you get uh, Jacob and Esau, Isaac and Ishmael, Joseph and the boys. It goes on and on and on, right? Uh, sibling rivalry is a major one, and we get this almost initially in, in, in their stories of their conception and, and birth. Well, let's, let's deal with this one last issue, and then we'll call it a night. I knew we wouldn't do two verses. Uh, the role of the two brothers. This won't take us long. So again, she bore his brother. Notice, she didn't bear a son. She bore Cain's brother. All right? What striking language. Hey, wouldn't you hate to be described like that with your siblings? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you, you got eighteen brothers and sisters, right? It's, it's, you know, this, this is Candace, our eldest. This, these are her brothers. Mom, I got a name too, right? You know, I'm. God loves me at least. Um, but yeah, you know. Oh, I mean, here's Cain, our favorite. This is his brother. I don't even know if he's ours. Right? It's just, he just landed in our lap one day. Um, but Cain is a farmer, right? He, he, he works the ground. Uh, Abel is a rancher, right? He's from Texas, and he, he takes care of, of domesticated animals. Um, now, we need to note here, there is nothing wrong with these, these vocations. Right? There's nothing wrong. The Bible isn't saying, look, uh, if you hang out with sheep, you're better than them who till the ground. No, because Adam tilled the ground, right? That was the curse, right? That, it, it, so, so there's nothing wrong with either one of these vocations. The primary vocation, one was was rancher, the other was farmer. However, I want you to, I think it's fascinating. I don't know if we can read too much into it, but I find it fascinating, and uh, I'm so excited to see everybody. I'll share it with you. What is the order in verse 1? Cain and Abel. What's the order in verse 2? Abel was a rancher. Cain was a farmer. It's inverted. There's plenty of people who, who have their reasons why that is, and uh, we can make them up if you'd like to. Um, but it could just be good poetic writing, right? Um, or there could be something significant in there. I, I don't know what it is. It could be a, a signifying that Abel was actually um, ahead of his brother in terms of righteousness. God will do the same thing with Jacob and Esau. Esau is older, but God chose Jacob to be the son of promise. Uh, sort of a thing going on with Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was born first of Abraham, but Isaac is the son of promise. Maybe this is sort of the, the, the genesis of that. I don't know. It's just a fascinating point worth, worth highlighting there. Um, uh, but also, uh, the writer subtly foreshadows um, who these men re really are. Um, one is the seed of the serpent. Right? We don't know that yet in the story. We're only two verses into it. But Cain is the seed of the serpent. 1 John 3.12 says Cain was of the evil one, seed of the serpent. While the other is the seed of righteousness. Hebrews 11 says Abel is commended as righteous. Right? All of that is in the first two verses of the story. And what follows begins right here. 
Instead of salvation, Cain comes and brings a curse. And, and what God must do in that chaos is bring order. We're not there yet because we haven't gotten to the chaos yet. And we'll probably look at the chaos next week and ten weeks down the road we'll look at the order. But nevertheless, here we are. Any questions I could dodge? Frank, or not you, Frank, but, but you know, the old Frank. Do you got any questions? I do miss him. I would love to hear what Frank had to say about coronavirus. I survived the war. What is this? I mean, I took down Nazis, right? I mean, anyway. All right, with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Um, let's, we'll stand up. I almost forgot we did this. Let's stand up and we pray. We can't hold hands, otherwise Andy might be watching. Um, and, uh, um, right, well, <laughs> I've picked on a Frank and an Andy, like, at, at 30 seconds, and you've probably, what? <laughs> so, all right, so we'll pretend we're holding hands. Um, and uh, uh, what do you think the, you know, whenever this came out, what people thought when they were reading the Bible says, greet each other with a holy kiss. No wonder they're blaming Christians for all this, right? <laughs> you know. All right, with that, let's go to Lord in prayer. God, thank you for allowing us to be here together. Man, what, what a celebration this is that, that, that we are able to see each other again, to laugh together again, to open our Bibles together again, to grow together again. It's a real celebration. And Lord, um, if we take away anything from, from our study of God's word, let it be the beauty of the church. Uh, that we really are a family. And, and, uh, um, and we really miss each other. And our lives are better when we are together. Uh, so Lord, thank you for the local church. May we be stronger because we've gone through this affliction. Um, and may we understand who we are as a church and what our mission is as a church. So Lord, thank you for, for those who, who bravely came out today. Uh, thank you for those who, who have joined us online. Um, and, and those who may uh, catch this later, Lord, may, may you bless each and every one of them. Uh, that you would use them as fishers of men. Um, and that souls would be saved. And you would be glorified. In the name of your glory, Son, we pray. Amen.